Thank you very much for the reminder. It's recording now. Uh, thank you. Um, so we will start now with the session. So uh, we have uh, six talks and, and first we have Fabrizio Ferro from Genova um, talking about the CMS uh, precision proton spectrometer. So you have, uh, you have 18 minutes and I remind you when there are three minutes before starting questions. Okay, thank you. So I will tell you about uh, what uh, we do in the, with the proton precision spectrometer in CMS, especially for what concerns the, the proton reconstruction. And then uh, I will tell you very quickly a few uh, things about uh, the outlook for uh, building a near beam spectrometry at the high luminosity LHC. Uh, let me see if I can, okay. So the CMS precision proton spectrometer that uh, we used to call PPS uh, has the goal to measure the, uh, the proton kinematics of the protons that has been scattered farther away at interaction point of CMS. Uh, and uh, uh, these protons are the ones that uh, have survived the, uh, the interaction. So the typical processes that we want to study are the ones that are shown here where a central system is created with the, by the exchange of uh, photons or, or gluons, but the, the main interacting protons survive the interaction. And so you can get, uh, you can tag them uh, far away from the, from the interaction point. The important things to measure is uh, the, 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 the kinematics. So is uh, what we call psi, the proton momentum loss. And uh, uh, we will see how we'll, uh, how we'll do that. The detectors, as I said, are placed in a specific station, something like 200 meters away from the interaction point of CMS. So the, uh, the detectors that we use to do that are placed, as I said, inside the, the, the LHC beam itself, beam pipe itself. And uh, we get very close to the beam, something like one, two millimeters. And we have both tracking detectors that are the ones that are really used to measure the, the, the kinematic parameters that we need. You can see here a couple of, um, of detector packages, but also we have timing detectors that are mainly used for the, reje the rejection of the pileup that, uh, that we have. So I will focus on what we can do with the tracking detectors. Here you see the typical uh, hits that you get in the tracking detector. So you can see in red where uh, the, most of the protons uh, go to impact into our, uh, our detectors. So only a, a very small, a very tiny region of the detectors is, uh, is, is used to, uh, to get most of the, of the protons that have been scattered. And the, uh, the proton reconstruction, it works. First, uh, you reconstruct the heat. Then using the fact that you have a perfectly aligned locally your detectors, you can uh, reconstruct the track. And then with the track, and with the fact that you have global alignment allied your detectors with respect to the beam, and that you have a very precise knowledge of the beam optics, you can reconstruct the proton kinematics at the, at the origin, at the interaction point. So let's see how we do all this. The first thing that we do is a, a local alignment. So typically what we do, we use uh, some uh, alignment runs at the very beginning of the operations. We call them uh, alignment runs, special runs. And uh, to align the detectors with respect to themselves, uh, what we do, we use the fact that there, there, is, there is overlap between the verticals and the horizontal detectors. And so you can easily align them locally. Then another thing that is important to do is to know where the detectors are with respect to the beam. To do that, for example, you can use the uh, elastic events that you can measure in, uh, in these special runs. And uh, using these elastic events, you can, have a, you can measure the position of the beam. And so you can know, at least in, in one direction, you can know exactly where you are with respect to the beam, which is of fundamental importance. 
then you have to translate all this in, uh, in the physics fields. So in the runs uh, in which you have high luminosity in which you take data for, for the physics. Uh, you can use, uh, for example, for the horizontal alignment, uh, you can use some uh, specific uh, observable, some specific pattern, like the, one that, the ones that are shown in the, in the first picture. You have the black curve, which is the reference curve that has been, uh, that has been measured in your reference field, your calibration field. Then you have the blue line, which is measured in the physics fields before the alignment. And what you do, you, uh, you align your detectors in a, in, a, in a way that the blue line becomes the red line. So there is a perfect overlap between, between the, the calibration line, the reference line, and the uh, physics fields line. Then for the vertical alignment, we do uh, a similar uh, thing for what we did for the, for the last scattering, but with the, 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 let's say the beam profile, and we manage to get an estimation of where the beam, e, the beam is, and so we get the global alignment also for the, for the physics phase. So assuming that we have done all the needed alignment, what we have to do is to play with the LHC optics. So the, 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 the most important things to do and most uh, probably uh, difficult one to do when you do the uh, proto reconstruction is the fact that you have, you measure the, uh, the position of the protons 200 meter away from the interaction point, and then you want to have the, uh, the, the, the momentum loss at the interaction point, okay? So you need to invert the transport matrix of the proton. And if you look at these two lines uh, at the end, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see how this, uh, this matrix can be, let's say, inverted at least for the main terms, which are, okay, the, the, the only ones that really are of interest for us. And especially what we want to do is, to measure x and y and to get the xi at the, uh, at the interaction point. This is the, uh, our, our goal, okay? The, the dispersion is one of the, uh, the, the, the most important parameters of the LHC optics to do this. And, uh, and also you can see magnification and uh, effective length, but especially the dispersion is, is absolutely important. So, what we do is the fact that we already know uh, in, a, in a at first level of, of precision the, 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 the optics of the LHC because uh, we have the information from the machine itself uh, and we have programs like MADIX that can make a simulation on, on, of where your proton is uh, uh, um, if, you, if it has undergone a certain kind of uh, scattering at the interaction point. But of course, all this is not uh, precise enough for what we have to do because you have uh, parameters inside the LHC that, that not even the, the, the expert of the LHC machine uh, knows precisely enough for what we need. And so what we want to do is to measure some parameters in order to calibrate, okay, to, to do a calibration of the optics machinery that we have in hands. One kind of calibration that we can do is to calibrate the magnification, the, the effective length in the y direction, because this can be done uh, in the elastic events in which you have xi equal zero, so you can access directly ly. And uh, in the, the, the corresponding point uh, in terms of Xi, where you have Ly equal zero, we can call it Xi zero. And uh, uh, you can using the, uh, the, 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 the plots that you can see here in, in, in the center part of the, of the slide, you can see that your uh, uh, beam profile is done like this, and you can get a, a point here at the center, this, this red dot here, which is the, the point that corris corresponds to the, uh, to the situation which you have L y equal zero. Doing this, you can have a value, you can measure a value of the dispersion corresponding to this xi zero. 
this is a point that you really measure and you can use as a, a starting point for the calibration of your optics. And putting all these things that you measure inside the MedEx machinery, you can have a much more precise knowledge of the optics uh, than you would have uh, if you just use the, uh, the, 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 nominal, the nominal one, okay? So in the end, what you get is, for example, are, for example, these curves, the color curves here that uh, assigns from, a, from an X that you measure inside your detectors, XI, that uh, co a corresponding XI at interaction point. Then we can do the, the reconstruction of the proton kinematics uh, um, with, two, with two different methods. One uh, method uses just only set of detectors, uh, just uh, in, in which is called the single Roman pot method, and a simplified version of your, uh, of your uh, equations. So Xi is uh, equal to X over, over the dispersion. And uh, it, it utilizes the curves that I've shown you before. And uh, unfortunately, what you have here is that you have to use the smearing of the scattering angle that you don't know. Uh, so this gives you a limited resolution, but you know very well the systematics, which is something that you always like. But you can also put all together the information that you get from uh, at least two stations that you have from the same from the same side of the of the interaction point, and you minimize this chi square chi square function in which you have your the the, the, the parameters that you measure in your detectors uh, with respect to the ones that you 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 expect from the the, the optical function, and so from these fits you can get. Uh, from this minimization, you can get the XI that you want, want to have. This implies, in, improves very well the resolution of, of XI. As you can see here in this, uh, in the, in this plot, uh, you can see the blue line with respect to the red line, but you have more problems with the systematic uncertainties that are uh, more difficult to, to handle with this kind of, uh, with this kind of procedure. We made some control plots to, this is just to show you that, uh, that, we, can, uh, that we can do the job uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way. And also we validated this, uh, this measurement with, uh, with some, uh, let's say, candle processes. The candle processes that we use are uh, the, 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 the D-muon production. So in the central system, you have uh, only two leptons, specifically two muons, and you get one or two protons in your, uh, in your, in your detector. So these are uh, events that are very easy to, uh, to trigger and to reconstruct. And uh, if, you, uh, if you put in a plot the, uh, the, the XI measured with the in the central system and the XI measured with the, directly with the protons, you can see that the real uh, events, uh, the real central exclusive uh, production events are placed on this, uh, on this dia on the diagonal of this, uh, of this plot as it should be. Three okay. more minutes before uh, starting questions. Okay, I will go very quick. So. The second part, the second and last part of the talk will be about the, uh, the future of PPS and the future of the, uh, the near-beam detectors at late C. So we will take data in, uh, in RAL3, so the, 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 the game is not yet over, but also we are considering to, uh, to build detectors and to install detectors in LHC also for the high luminosity phase. Uh, the goal will be to study with uh, an, an extended uh, mass range and with uh, much more uh, statistics, uh, this kind of process or so central uh, exclusive production processes. Okay. Uh, we will be able to study standard model processes uh, like uh, in, the, in the domain of QCD, of electroweak physics, uh, of top physics, and uh, maybe also X physics, but this we would rely on specific uh, detectors installed 400 meters away, which is really, which is really an uh, ambition, I would say a couple of words in the next slides. Also, the, let's say the beyond the standard model physics uh, uh, as some uh, menu that we could, uh, could investigate uh, if we had these, uh, these new stations installed. 
uh, with the fact that you you have a gamma gamma interaction and the fact that you can close the the kinematics of the event uh, you can uh, have access uh, to some studies of um, things like axion like particles uh, uh, things like this lepton production because you close very well the kinematics of the events uh, and uh, also something like uh, anomalous gauge couplings because you can produce uh, a couple of W by the fusion of the of, uh, of two photons and you can improve if you're not if you're not to if not measuring the, the 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 anomalous gauge coupling you can at least improve the limits on that so speaking about detector uh, the the regions that would be interested by this uh, let's say future uh, upgrade a very upgrade a big upgrade of the project would be not only the region in which we, we already have the, the the stations now the detectors now at 100 meter but maybe also in in a second stage i would say also something uh, some detectors put at 400 meter that would allow to access very low uh, masses like the x1 here you can see what i mean with the mass acceptance and you can see for example in this plot uh, that without uh, the 400 meter uh, stations we would have access to masses from 100 gv to something like 2 3 tv but with uh, also some station at 400 meter we would have access also to the to the to the x mass and these pictures are also here to show that uh, with the high luminosity operation of the lhc we also expect some changing acceptance during during the run because uh, everything in the LH accelerator will be much more dynamic than what it is now so I'm in the end. Uh, I've tried to describe you in a very few words and very quickly uh, the, the, the proton reconstruction that we do with the PPS in, inside the CMS experiment. Uh, we have taken data successfully in run two and uh, we hope to do the same uh, even better in run three. And we also have some perspective for a PPS or something similar uh, for the high luminosity phase of LEC. I didn't talk about any physics performance of PPS. This will be uh, the, the, the topic of the talk by Xenia Selina tomorrow afternoon or morning, depending where you are. Thank you. Thank you, Farisa, for this talk. Uh, uh, this time, just for a quick question. Um, Anthony, you have a common question? Yes, quick question. Uh, what is the range of Xi uh, you can measure really with? Yeah, at present. At present, uh, we go from uh, a few percent to something like uh, 15, 16 percent, more or less. So you can really go to small size also? Yes, uh, two, three percent. Now it depends on which, uh, which, which acceptance exactly they want to quote, but uh, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. And, and we will go now to the next talk um, by Dimitri okay. um, Sosnov. Um, Dimitri, I don't know whether you could share your screens now. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Uh, then... okay. Uh, okay, can you see the slides? So, yeah, you can start. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank the organizer for the possibility to uh, show the talk about the first uh, measurement of the forward rapidity gap distribution in uh, proton light collisions uh, at, in LHC with the CMS. Uh, and uh, it uh, based on the uh, recent uh, preliminary CMS result. Uh, information about uh, about the analysis shown on the page number two. Uh, and uh, we, there is, uh, uh, there are four different types of inelastic collisions, uh, non-diffractive uh, and three types of diffractive collisions. In diffractive scattering, the energy transfer between uh, two interaction hadrons is small, but one or two, uh, uh, hadrons dissipate into a multiparticle final state. 
the and the remaining uh, configuration corresponds to uh, inelastic iteration. Uh, a diffractive process is uh, characterized by the rapidity gap. It is a rapidity region free from, from final state, which is caused by T channel uh, Pomeran exchange. And investigation of diffractive process provides important information of mechanisms uh, of high energy interactions. Most important problems uh, can be solved with. Uh, 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 with uh, for, for rapidity gap uh, diffraction uh, observations is the nature of uh, Pimeron in QCD. And uh, second is small X problem and problem of saturation of partner densities. Uh, the fractions on the uh, nuclear targets uh, also very relevant for cosmic ray physics, but uh, the latest uh, proton nuclear measurements on were done uh, by Helios uh, about uh, 30 years ago in in energy uh, about 27 uh, GV. Uh, as I said, so the diffractive process uh, characterized by the rapidity gap, the rapidity regions free from final state particles. Uh, it's the, one of the most inclusive way uh, to study diffraction, but until now, only proton-proton diffraction was observed on the LHC uh, with the forward rapidity gap. Uh, for example, uh, on the right part of uh, slide number four, uh, you can see comparison between proton-proton uh, measurements with uh, ATLAS and CMS uh, collaborations. Uh, for the for such analysis, we need uh, the good instrument, uh, which is a CMS detector. The central feature of CMS uh, detector is the superconducting solenoid uh, with uh, with magnetic field about uh, 3.8 Tesla, and our analysis based uh, mostly on four parts of CMS detector. It's the silicon tracker, uh, two colorimeters, electromagnetic and hadron in the central region, and two forward hadron colorimeters named as HF on both sides of the detector, which covers the space between three and uh, 5.2 units of safety rapidity. Uh, the data from tracker and colorimeter in central parts combined to CMS uh, particle flow objects. And we, use, uh, we used two types uh, of triggers. First, uh, require of presence of proton and uh, lead uh, in uh, in uh, in HF region with energy more than seven GV in one of uh, HF colorimeters, and the next is the bias trigger, uh, which uh, require presence of proton and lead beams in the same as detector at all. Uh, and analysis made on minimum bias and zero bias trigger was used only for cross-section corrections. Uh, for the analysis, uh, we used about uh, 6.5 uh, uh, inverse uh, microburns of CMS data collected in uh, 2016 with center of mass energy per nucleon uh, equal 8 TV. Uh, we are looking for the events with the forward rapidity gap started from the end of HF region. And we have two different uh, types of topologies shown on the page uh, number six. Uh, we have Pomeran lead and Pomeran proton topologies with the, the lead and proton deceleration uh, res uh, respectively. On the images, you can see the schematic of such topologies in which uh, blue and red cones indicates products of uh, diffracting dissipations of lead and proton, and the regions free from final state particles marked with the green arrow. Uh -oh. uh, the final state topology uh, of the Pomeran proton, oh, I'm sorry, uh, of the Pomeran proton uh, scattering is uh, undist uh, undistinguishable from the uh, Pomeran uh, from the topology of ultra peripheral uh, electromagnetic uh, gamma p process, uh, and we don't operate such on the other topology 
because it's suppressed to a factor about G square compared to Fermion uh, proton topology. Also, for, for analysis, we using three Monte Carlo uh, event generators. It's Hijink uh, and Epos, and they was used on detector and hardened level. And Kudjet Jet uh, detect Monte Carlo detect, uh, generator was used on uh, generator level on. Also, it's important to say that all of these generators don't include don't include uh, photon exchange processing. Uh, for the analysis, we are using minimum bias data with uh, offline checks uh, for the events with not greater than one primary vertex and energy of HF at least 10 GV. Uh, and our data sample based on events with at least one tower uh, in HF, uh, in, with one tower in HF, in HF uh, region. And we select the repeat gap uh, in beans uh, per half eta, starting from uh, the end of uh, HF region. Uh, and we require at least one HF tower in opposite, uh, greater than 10 GV in opposite HF uh, region. And the requirement for minimal activity uh, that we call over therapeutic gap uh, is uh, shown on the page number seven. We require no tracks with trans transverse uh, momentum larger than 200 MeV and total energy of all particle flow candidates less than 6 GV in the central uh, part of detector. And for the, uh, for the region where we have no tracking, uh, we ask uh, total energy of uh, particle flow hadronic candidates uh, uh, should be less than 13 uh, GV. For the correction to the uh, cross section, we using the Rabais data with requirement of the track presence. Uh, and the result is uh, the uh, picture that, uh, that can show a result of uh, such correction is shown on the upper part of uh, page number seven. And after this selection, we got the detector level uh, for the PET gap cross section for the data and Monte Carlo shown on page number uh, eight. Uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, on the page number eight. Uh, and you can see on the left part, uh, you can see the forward repeating up uh, cross sections for the data and Monte Carlo uh, predictions uh, on the upper part of uh, image and the ratio between data and Monte Carlo on the bottom part of plot. Uh, I need to say that all Monte Carlo spectra are normalized to the total visible cross section. But we can see that for both topologies, the spectra fall by factor over 50 uh, between uh, on the first uh, four beams. And for the uh, other part of uh, spectra, oh, the, for the other part of uh, image spectra flatten uh, for the both topologies. And the prediction for EPOS are closer to data with uh, than uh, the predictions of hydrogen. And for the Formeron proton topology, uh, all Monte Carlo predictions are significantly below the data with the read for the uh, second part of, uh, of uh, plot. And it, uh, um, it is from the uh, significant uh, contribution from gamma P events. And if we uh, separate these plots uh, by the types of process. Uh, we can see on the page number nine that uh, non diffractive process are dominates for the first part of the plot. Uh, it means we need to extend our for the PG gap uh, acceptance to be more sensitive to diffractive process. Uh, to do that, uh, we are using the method uh, shown on the page number. In the slide number 10, we need to find events with no energy in hardened colorimeter region at the site with uh, for repeat gap. 
for the Monte Carlo, we simply use uh, data on particle level. And for the data, we use data-driven method based on waiting for the polytrapeutic gap cross-section spectra by the probability to have no signal in corresponding uh, each of. For that, we compare distribution of maximum forward uh, HF tower energy from non-colliding events and the events with certain forward rapidity gap for every forward rapidity gap beam. Uh, from that comparison, we uh, can find the fraction of events without energy uh, in HF. And we do that for uh, separately on the zero bias data. Uh, we call obtained uh, results as diffractive enhanced, enhanced subsample. And and we can have uh, three minutes for questions. Okay. And, uh, uh, our, uh, our corruption, our, our uh, corrections, uh, uh, all, after all our corrections, we correspond to the Hadron level uh, shown on the page number uh, 11. Uh, and the main uh, the main sentence uh, uh, we have the same for uh, the same uh, requirements on the on the generator level that as uh, that was on detector level, and uh, on the page number uh, twelve uh, you can see the hadron level uh, cross section uh, for the diffractive enhanced some sample. And uh, you can see that the, for the Pomeron led topology case, where the photon exchange contribution negligible predictions of EPOS uh, and QGS jet is about a factor of two and four below the data, uh, but the shape is similar to the data. And the spectrum from hydrogen generator falls at large uh, rapidity gap size. It's contradict to the data. And for the second uh, Pomeron proton case, uh, all the generators are more than factor of five below the data. This suggests to a very strong contribution from gamma P events. And if we uh, separate uh, these uh, plots by the uh, types of processes, uh, you, can, uh, on, you can see on the page number 13, uh, that uh, now the diffractive process strongly dominates for the most of uh, distribution for both EPOS and QGS just pred uh, predictions. Uh, as summary, I can say that the forward rapidity gap uh, distribution from proton led collisions at the LHC have been measured for the first time for both Pomeron led and Pomeron proton topologies. And for the Pomeron uh, led topology, when gamma exchange contribution uh, uh, should be negligible, the predictions of EPOS and QGS below the data, but uh, have the similar shape that uh, data has. And the rapidity spectrum from hydrogen generator at uh, larger rapidity gap sizes falls in contradiction to the data. For the Pomeron proton case, the cross sections uh, are lower by. Uh, lower the data by the factor of five, and it suggests a very strong contribution from gamma P events. And uh, that's, um, that means that uh, these events should be uh, implemented in the, uh, should be uh, implemented in uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, yeah. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, this data may be uh, of significant help of modern uh, ultra high energy cosmic ray uh, air showers. And uh, thank you for attention. Thank you, Dimitri, for, for this talk. Uh, was, um, now it's time for, uh, for questions or comments. We have time for, uh, if anybody has any comments, you can raise your hand. So um, I have, um, yeah, why we don't, why we wait for, me for one comment or question. Um, Dimitri, can you tell us uh, um, about the, this uh, contribution that you have in the Bayou-Pomeron proton case? You see this gamma proton contribution. Um, what is the, how do you plan to, 
include Monte Carlos for that? Are there any? Um, in uh, in our country, uh, current analysis, we do not uh, plan uh, to we do not plan to include uh, any additional uh, corrections to the Monte Carlos in current analysis. But uh, for the future, first of all, uh, we we will be uh, glad to uh, to talk with the authors of Monte Carlos. And uh, for now, we have some uh, uh, we have some chats with the author of QGSJ, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe they they will include something in uh, in these generators. But uh, there is another option. We theoretically, in uh, additional uh, studies, as additional studies, uh, we can, uh, for example, uh, check uh, some uh, Mont uh, do some additional checks uh, with Monte Carlos uh, that can uh, provide some photo some uh, photo production. Uh, some yeah, production, mm -hmm. but uh, but for now we uh, our current our checks uh, say that uh, we have some problems with the, this uh, gamma, uh, with this gamma key contributions in uh, all Monte Carlo we used. So uh, for us uh, for this analysis uh, we cannot do for this analysis. Okay. For the for maybe for the next we we can uh, do some additional studies, but uh, okay. for now I don't I don't want it and don't know uh, what we can uh, do in some steps. That, that's fine. Um, well, that will be that will be interesting to see. Um, okay, Dimitri, thank you for your talk and and the discussion. So now we go to the next talk by Wojtek um, Slominski. Uh, if you could share your screen. Yes, hello, I'm just trying. Yeah. Well, okay, fine. Um, yeah, you, I yeah, think yeah. well, so I'm going to tell about the some simulations and some possibilities of measurements of the inclusive diffraction at the EIC. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you. Could you share your screen because we can't see it. Um, pardon? Uh, could you share your, your screen so we can see your Something slides. went wrong. Okay, what? Uh, I think, okay. I haven't pressed the share button. It's coming. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fine. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to tell about uh, some simulations and uh, possible measurements of the inclusive diffraction at uh, EIC. Uh, that is the, that uh, that's, these studies were done with uh, in collaboration with Nestor, Paul, and Anna. Uh, uh, the plan is to tell about uh, the diffractive model used for this data simulation. Uh, and then I would show some results uh, of the possible fits for diffractive PDFs, diffractive FL, and uh, fully four-dimensional diffractive cross-section, uh, how well they can be measured at EIC, what can we expect? Uh, okay, so uh, just to uh, briefly remind what is the scenario we are talking about. This is uh, a deep plane elastic scattering uh, when, where they tagged proto when the target proton uh, remains intact. That is, it leaves the interaction region in a, a very forward direction that is with a uh, quite large longitudinal momentum fraction denoted here by XL, small pt. Uh, the, uh, except for uh, uh, the standard DIS variables here for the, the this diffraction we have, uh, also specific variables, which is the uh, momentum fraction of the ex diffractive exchange, which I denote here by Xi, which is often, well, very often also denoted 
uh, elsewhere by X Pomeron. And we have this beta, which is the momentum fraction of the struck quark with respect to this diffractive exchange. So of course the Bjorkane X is just the product of say times beta. Uh, at EIC, we have very good possibility and equipment to, to tag this final proton. Uh, the cross sections as usual are given in terms of the reduced cross sections, uh, which uh, are roughly equal to the F2 structure uh, function. Uh, now the model, as it was used Terra for uh, uh, fitting QCD models to uh, the diffractive events, to, uh, yeah, to describe diffraction, uh, there is some more specific model used to um, parameterize the structure, the diffractive structure functions. Namely, the uh, structure functions are given as sum of two factorized terms. That is the, uh, okay, the first term is Pomeron contribution, which we also could say is just genuine diffraction. But to fit the data, to describe the data, we also need some correction that physically we could think about some extra subleading exchanges and so on. Whatever it's a nickname of that term was the region term, which is maybe not the most proper name, but okay, how that is how it was named uh, in the experimental papers. Okay, anyway, the, 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 each component is just a product of the, the uh, this phi is, uh, we could say the pro pomeron flux that is just an amount of pomer of uh, pomerons in the proton multiplied by the structure function of the proton uh, the fluxes of, of the reg form and the uh, 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 and the qcd enters the game through the uh, expressing the pomeron structure function uh, through the standard collinear factorization theorem just from the Pomeron PDFs, so the last step of the whole business. <laughs> this parameterization is just uh, producing these Pomeron PDFs from via the Diglap evolution uh, and uh, with some initial, so very simple parameterization. Okay, let's have a look now at the kinematic range, uh, where we are. The blue area is the Hera range. Uh, we see the, 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 the other bands which go to the right correspond to EIC, three standard, I would say, uh, energy, beam energy uh, uh, setups, uh, each of them moving more or less in X uh, by factor five. Uh, surely we should not uh, forget about the uh, other side that is where, the, where we go to much higher energies like, like LHEC, but we would go to 20 times smaller axes. Well, let's come closer to the IC uh, design. Um, it, there's very, very important improvement with respect to Hera is very good uh, final proton tagging. Uh, I plot here the a kinematic range covered by EIC in the XL versus uh, T versus XL or whatever, T and XL plane uh, for different uh, energies, that is uh, proton energy, the three main energy setups. Uh, the colored area is uh, the area co uh, covered uh, by EIC. This uh, gray rectangle is the area covered by Hera. So we clearly see a uh, substantial improvement here. Uh, another point uh, is uh, the closer to the detector capabilities, that is the uh, resolution in uh, various variables uh, used to describe uh, kinematic variables, yeah? used in the diffractive DIS, that is X, Y, Q squared, beta, and psi. All these, as you can see from these plots, are very uh, well reconstructed. What is plotted here, the green histograms are just the data generated from the Rapgap Monte Carlo. And the uh, red curves are the reconstructed uh, values uh, from the data which were passed through the detector simulation. 
So we see that uh, we can uh, be pretty sure about the very good accuracy of the, uh, of the measurement. Uh, here also I plot uh, analogous plots, but this time for the variables related to um, final proton packing, that is XL and T and PT. Again, we see that uh, we have, uh, okay, I would say very nice uh, uh, and good uh, resolution. Uh, okay, there is some uh, small hole in the detector, which may be, it is just uh, as according to, to current, current design, maybe it will be, uh, it will disappear, I don't know. Okay, it is there. So uh, let me come to the results which we uh, obtained. Um, the first one is the, uh, the fit to the diffractive PDFs. How to do it? Okay, we first we, gener we generate the data, the pseudo data. We assume binning of four, four bins per order of magnitude in each of beta psi, Q squared, and psi. This is three dimensional. Uh, uh, that, that is T integrated cross section. We know that we have very good acceptance and purity in the data. So the bin, that binning is uh, really very safe. So the simulation of the data uh, goes from the extra, we first extrapolate from uh, the Zeus SJ here, uh, model of the diffractive PDFs. And then, then we add random smearing of is, uh, corresponding to the systematic error of 5%, which is quite, uh, is quite uh, I would say, safe or big for, for what is planned at TIC, and statistical error, which uh, follows uh, the 10 inverse femtoburns integrated luminosity. Uh, okay, well, it is, uh, the fact is that the errors are dominated by systematics. And then we make a uh, fit uh, to these simulated data during making this fit, we strictly follow the procedure that was um, used at Terra. This is done because we want to just to compare what is the effect, we say net effect here, yeah, of the uh, higher precision data from EIC. Uh, actually, we considered two cases were for the gluon parametrization, namely uh, this, this simple form of initial gluon parametrization has three parameters. As it was done at Terra, we also consider a simplified case where the initial gluon is just a constant. That uh, is used to uh, test how, how the data are uh, sensitivity to this parametrization. Uh, okay, just uh, to uh, see how what is the quality of the simulated data. Here is uh, some of them are plotted. Um, uh, errors are really very small, so I even scaled them by factor two to make them visible in the plot. Okay, so then now we can see the results of the fit. Uh, and what is here, the, the, the blue and red and brown uh, uh, lines with the error bands are the results of the S and C fit. And this hashed area is the uh, HERA result, the Zeus SJ result. So what we see that at large Z, we get quite a big improvement in the, in the uh, uh, Okay, in uncertainty, the much smaller uncertainty of the quark PDFs. For in the gluon case, uh, there is no improvement. Well, it is well known fact that to pin down the gluon uh, from the inclusive data, we must have uh, data at much lower Z values. Uh, by the way, we also made simulations for the inclusive diffraction on nuclei. Uh, the precision of data looks uh, very good, but there is no model to fit. So it is not very much more to say about uh, uh, diffraction of nuclei here. Uh, okay, now when we look at the extrapolation of the uh, cross-section, uh, of the, uh, this diffractive cross-section 
from the from this HERA parametrization, from the Zeus parametrization. Here the cross section is plotted against psi, and the yellow area is the area which was not covered by HERA. This is something that can be uh, uh, explored at EIC. So we see that in this region uh, we can learn quite quite much about. The, the 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 structure of this okay diffractive or forward proton uh, 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 events the the red line is pomeron contribution the green line is this region contribution we see that at large xi it is much higher and this is the place where we could learn something about it also the low xi region is very interesting because of lower energy which we have here at uh, EIC, uh, the FL contribution is quite big. So, first we looked at the possibility of measurements. Of three, three more minutes. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have uh, simulated data. Okay, that's, uh, I would say, challenging uh, or brave, but we used 18 energy beam setups. Okay, it is possible, it is possible with the IC, if it is less, okay, then we will have a little bit less data. But having a possibility of several energy setups, uh, we can scan the results for uh, the uh, energy or Y behavior. The, the sigma, the cross section here yeah, depends on F2 and FL, and the coefficient here, this YL is just a function of Y. So having more data, we can fit these results to find out FL. And uh, this is an example of uh, some of these data. We obtained something like 80 bins like that. That is FL versus beta, diffractive FL versus beta. And we see that uh, the measurement uh, uh, seems to be really feasible and within the reach of uh, EIC. Uh, okay, and the last uh, topic is simulation of uh, uh, four-dimensional cross-section that is uh, also looking at the T-dependence. In particular, we use a Dixi and T-dependence, which in our parametrization was just con uh, contained, was contained in, in the flux factors. And uh, what we see that these are the, the lines are the extrapolation, the points are simulation, simulated data. We see that the errors are very small. And for these plots, the several curves are for different values of Xi. And we clearly see that the possibility of detecting the slope change with Xi is uh, really uh, uh, very, very high. Uh, actually, we haven't done uh, really the fits so far, but we, so far, we realized that we could do this. This is the same cross section, but plotted here against Xi, where we see that the shape in Xi, which in this model is sort of double slope shape, uh, is clearly visible here with, within the errors, which maybe could be even smaller uh, at final, uh, at final uh, EIC design. So let me summarize. Uh, First, about the EIC detector, we see the really po many possibilities from the final proton tagging. We have seen uh, and studied a good, uh, and we know that we have very good acceptance and the resolution for the diffractive BIS variables. And what I pointed out for the prospects for precise electron proton, electron nucleon uh, diffractive cross section measurements. Uh, prospects for quark PDFs extraction, uh, uh, FL determination, and also precise uh, study of the Pomeron and subleading contribution to the, uh, the cross-section. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Wojtek. Um, is, is there any comments or questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead, go ahead. Uh, hello, Wojtek. <clears throat> uh, I, I, could you could you go to the transparency number number eleven? Eleven. Yes, I think so. 
I can do it. If I find my mouse, I will do it. Um, 11. This one? Uh, 11. It's 10. No, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. This one. Yeah. Uh, this region, which uh, you found very interesting, I mean, this yellow one, uh, which is not covered basically, but, but in Hira, uh, the Pionic exchange is also very important. And the Pionic contribution, which might dominate over the region one, uh, is important. Uh, so you haven't analyzed that with the Pionic flux, uh, this, uh, this problem. Am I right? I mean, I, I would like to draw your attention I think to the Pion, Pion exchange contribution. The, and the, the, the diffractive uh, interaction on the on the pi on a virtual yeah, there is and the deck mechanism for example for the neutron production yes uh, exactly yeah, yeah I, I i think i know what you're talking about i think that this this model for describing the cross section here which is used it is you know it is difficult to say if we are you know i you know i call we called it already did this 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 is a secondary contribution was called region contribution. But right, right. The region is obvious, but the pioneer. But, no, no, no. But you know, it is. I'm, I'm, I'm hardly uh, uh, convinced it is just region. It is just a way of parameterizing anything which is different from Pomeron. Uh, actually, the uh, for the data for the fitting to the data, this uh, this this so-called region Pomeron was just taken from the pion uh, uh, here. So if this is pi zero, uh, yeah, uh, or uh, something else, it is just, uh, it, I think it is hard to, to, to distinguish just measuring this data. You know, if you, if you measure something like this, what people will also call the Sullivan yeah, process, that is, if you, if you tag the final proton, uh, then if you want to measure the pi zero exchange, it is, it must be some interplay uh, with the- I, I agree, I agree. But my point is that it should be included if it's not. If, if, there, is, if there is only, if there are only secondary region in this model for behind the green line, it's, uh, uh, it's not enough. I would say the pi on pi zero is uh, flux is, I mean, the, Okay, maybe. The term with the pionic flux is very important. And the second remark yeah. is about the FL. As you uh, remember, uh, some, some years ago, we did with uh, Agnieszka uh, some analysis on the, on the contribution from the QQ bar longitudinal uh, production. Yes. Uh, this QQ bar production from the longitudinal photons in the large beta region, uh, which might change a little bit the picture, which you have shown. So it might be worthwhile to analyze this uh, scenario also, that there yeah. is important contribution for large beta from this, uh, uh, from this uh, term with the QQ bar yes. used from longitudinal photons. Yeah. Just, just one thing, I, I, I think we will probably have to continue with the program, but this is a very interesting discussion and I suggest that... No, that, that's all what I wanted to say, I think. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, but yeah. Okay, the, I have a short answer only, you know, okay. it is, it is not, it is just this, this plot is not to be compared with any prediction. It is just to show if, what is the post technical, I would say, possibility to measure FL at EIC. You know, the model is just taken from the parameterization. You know, it, I do not compare here to Predictions. I just okay. Simply... Okay, Wojtek, I understand the point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very much. the point was just to you know to to look if if it is possible within accuracy of FL uh, of EIC to measure FL. Yeah, no, I, I think it's clear. Uh, but, and and we thank very much for this discussion and for yeah. your talk. Okay. Um, uh, I will suggest that we move to the next uh, talk. Uh, okay. And then this discussion okay. can continue okay. offline um, by Stefan uh, Monier. Uh, and Stefan, if you could share your... Yes, so I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Okay, good. On. So I share my screen now. Okay, yes, please so, go ahead. Is it fine, you see it in full screen? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so my talk is about a uh, theory talk about the asymptotics of uh, hard diffraction. So it's based on recent work with uh, Albulo and with uh, Anne Dungle, who is a PhD student, and actually this, uh, this is uh, fully included in his PhD thesis, but he has more, uh, and uh, he talks uh, about, uh, about his own independent work in a, in a separate uh, flash talk. So diffraction in deep analysis scattering, of course, it was a major highlight at ERA. Here is a beautiful example of such an event. The photon comes from the right, the electron from the left. That's the scattered electron. You see a ionic system here and a large angle between the direction of the scattered photon and the disadronic system. This is a nice signature of this diffractive event. And about 10% of ERA events were diffractive which came a bit as a surprise because it's not so easy to understand within the, the Parton model, let's say within a collinear factorization. And this really boosted uh, the interest in, uh, in saturation physics. There was this uh, beautiful Golets, Bernat and Gustav model in the end, of, uh, the end of the 90s, which uh, was able to describe in a very economical way, uh, both the diffractive and inclusive uh, cross section. So my talk is about diffractive dissociation, diffractive dissociation in electron nucleus scattering as we are moving towards the EIC and the LHEC. Uh, here, what dissociates is actually not the nucleus. Uh, it's not the kind of, uh, of processes that Thomas Lappi was, um, uh, was talking about in his, uh, in his uh, plenary talk, but uh, it's the virtual photon that is converted to a high mass uh, hadronic system here leaving a rapidity gap of size y0, so this is for it to reduce my rotation. Capital Y is the total uh, rapidity here of this um, subsystem. And I will focus on the, on the, the formula of observable, the solution of the rapidity gap, yeah, y0. Okay, but actually I will not address uh, deep lens scattering. Uh, this is really a theoretical talk. So I remember that uh, at, at very high energy, the photon actually fluctuates in, uh, into a QQ bar pair. And I will fix the size. And what I will actually study is the diffractive scattering of an onion of a fixed size uh, of a nucleus in uh, some particular kinematics. OK, so to set the stage, um, there are evolution equations for this observable established in QCD. So the basic ingredient is the, uh, the forward elastic S matrix element for dipole nucleus scattering. At zero rapidity, well, you take your favorite model, Gwilis, Bernard, Rustov, McLaren, Leo, Gopalan, and this evolves. Uh, uh, according to the Balitsky fox Shugov equation, which is this, uh, this nice, nice integral differential nonlinear equation. Now you get the total cross sections just from the optical theorem. This is twice one minus s. Now, if you stop your evolution at y zero, the, the size of the rapidity gap, you take the square of s and you further evolve this. As an, so you take this as an initial condition for the same DK equation as a, as a as above. Then uh, you take the derivative of the result with respect to y0. This is uh, the observable we are after. Yes. So this was the Kovchegov leading equation. This is the Kovchegov leading equation written about uh, 20 years ago. So this is actually, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, an analytical solution okay, in some asymptotic limits uh, to these uh, complicated equations. So it's really the, this solution, the solution to these equations that we are after, but of course they are very difficult to solve, so we are not going to um, to, to follow a, a straight mathematical path. We are going to uh, to find a picture, yes, to, um, to to see, to try to guess which are the dominant uh, contributions to this uh, cross section in some well-defined, some more precise parametric limits. And this involves uh, essentially to understand uh, what do the, the scattering configurations of Onya uh, look like. And then, okay, I will finish by presenting you the result. Okay, so this uh, this this, uh, this sketch is supposed to uh, to be um, the picture of a realization of uh, of one particular realization of the model squared of the wave function of the onion here of size r after evolution of our, our rapidity uh, y minus y zero. I immediately take the large MC limit so that I can represent this as a collection of color dipoles of uh, sizes uh, or i, so ca characterized by their, their sizes. So this is the famous uh, Muller's color dipole model to represent uh, QCD evolution. Now I want to scatter this off a nucleus. I go to the frame in which, so the onion has a rapidity y minus y zero. The, the nucleus has exactly the rapidity of the, of the, of the gap I want to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to calculate. 
So the cross section is what uh, is uh, one minus s, this s matrix element for this collection of, of dipoles that I have to understand, averaged over all uh, configurations of the uh, quantum fluctuations of the onion. And then eventually I take a, a cut here. Yes, and this, this cut uh, gives me this, uh, this factor of two. Yes, I can do the same for diffractive dissociation. So now I want diffractive dissociation cross section condition to a minimum uh, gap. So I want to uh, capture all events that have a, a minimum gap y, y, y zero. And uh, to this aim, I just need to scatter the system elastically. So the elastic scattering of the system is a uh, one minus S squared this time, which again, I average over all fluctuations of the realizations of the, the, the quantum evolution of the, of the onion. Okay, so now I need to, uh, to understand this uh, S matrix here of the collection of dipoles. Well, um, it is just the product of the S matrix of the individual dipoles, uh, thanks to two ingredients, the large NC limit or the number of color limits. That enables me to, uh, to use the dipole model, the color dipole model to represent the quantum evolution of the onion. And uh, to the fact that I'm interested actually in uh, large nuclei. So that, that's one of the parameters that, that I want to send to infinity, the uh, A, the, the number of, uh, of, of nucleons in my, in my uh, uh, nucleus. Okay, so these S actually, I know what they are. Each factor here in this product solves the, uh, the ordinary BK equation and um, I have some hints about the, uh, the solutions. I have some, I know some properties analytically of the, of the, the solution of the BK equation. Okay, I manipulate, uh, I message a little bit this formula so that it looks nicer. So instead of some, uh, of uh, taking the product of uh, individual dipoles, I, uh, I bin, I take bins of uh, dipole size. Actually, I like to go to a logarithmic uh, variable here for the dipole size. I define the X in this way, log of one over R squared times some uh, momentum scale. And here, okay, the product is labeled by the, the, the bins in size. And then I have this power N of X. So N here introduces also the density of dipole of a given size, of a given log size uh, X. Now, if I take the, the sizes of the bins to, to zero, well, I have this very nice formula. I, write, I can write this as a, the exponential of an integral. All this is exact so far. Well, starting from, this, uh, from these assumptions, from the usual assumptions in the, this field to establish the Kopchigov-Levin equation. Now, I afford a, a further approximation that actually turns out not to spoil my, my, uh, the asymptotics that I'm after the long probability asymptotics. I assume that S here, is uh, always close to one for all relevant values of x prime. And so this log becomes this one minus s. And this, uh, you see that this integral here is just the overlap between the dipole density in you know, one particular realization of the dipole, uh, of the, uh, the onion evolution, and uh, the dipole scattering amplitude, you know, one minus s, one minus s matrix for one uh, single dipole, so solution of the BK equation. I call this i, well, this is my notation. Now I go back to my cross section. So, so the cross section is two times one minus s. S is expansion minus r. I now am going to do some trivial mathematics, but you will see that it will uh, give me a, a very nice uh, formula. I factorize the expansion minus i. So I have two factors, and then I tailor expand the first one. Okay, so I have a, a series of k or factors. You see, you see that looks like a Poisson, a Poisson probability here for k. Poisson uh, distribution of parameter i. This is averaged over all the realizations of the, uh, the, the onion fluctuation at rapidity y minus y0. I call this wk. This wk has the interpretation of the probability that k dipoles in the wave function of my onion uh, effectively scatter uh, with the nucleus. Yes, it has a probabilistic interpretation. It goes uh, between zero and one. This is the interpretation that we like to give to this WK. You can do the same, exactly the same manipulation from, for the diffractive cross section. So I will not give you details. But that what I get is this funny formula. Sigma diff, well, sigma tot is twice the sum of our non all, non uh, all WK for non zero K. Sigma diffractive is the sum of this WK over all even values of, of k. So I find that diffractive cross section is the probability of an even number of participating dipoles. And you see that it's not just simple mathematics, uh, modulo this, uh, this approximation, but okay, uh, you might believe me that this is, uh, this is completely reasonable. Just straightforward mathematics that leads me to this, uh, this uh, interesting formula. 
So now, of course, what I need to do is to compute these weights. And to compute these weights, I need to understand well the, the scattering configuration of my ONIA that enter the, uh, the average weights here. OK, so this is one realization of my onion, the same as before, at rapidity y minus y0. And if I plot uh, the density of dipoles in this realization against uh, the size of the dipole, well, I get some, uh, some, compli uh, some complicated um, density here, which is a, a random, uh, random density. So, OK, you can't understand this in detail. So you, we need to model it. We need to understand, OK, what, what are the, the dominant the configurations that will dominate the observable that, uh, that we want uh, to calculate. And that's our model. We call it the for, uh, phenological model for, uh, for onium evolution and for the dipole density. So essentially, we assume that the, the, um, the evolution is essentially uh, a mean field evolution, a deterministic evolution, except for one fluctuation. OK, let me give, him, uh, give you a bit some, uh, some, some, some more details about this. So before. I would like to tell you that once you have, uh, to remind you that once you have this uh, dipole density, well, what you do to, to get your cross section is that you scatter here with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the dipole. Uh, you, you scatter with the nucleus using the, the decay uh, amplitude here. This gives you your overlap. And once you have your overlap, well, you compute the diffractive and the total cross section. OK, a few uh, words about the phenological model. Uh, very fast, uh, I don't want to enter the details just to, to show you that there are formulas that you can uh, do something quantitative. So here in this graph, I will represent the rapidity of the onion here on the y-axis, on the x-axis, the, the size of the dipoles. I start from an onion of size r here at rapidity 0. I evolve it deterministically. This uh, actually is done by, uh, so it gives me a, a solution. This deterministic evolution, what I mean by the specific evolution is an evolution through the BFKL equation up to a cutoff that, uh, that uh, models the discreteness of the, of the dipoles. And this is the formula. This line that you see here is actually the largest dipole in my event. And uh, the dipoles are to the right of this line, if you want to generate them by, by devolution. OK, and three more minutes. Yes, uh, fine. Uh, these are the, the formulas, uh, so I will not um, spend more time on this. And, and then what we need uh, is also the probability uh, distribution. So we need to put one fluctuation. And this fluctuation, actually, we, we will take it in the form of a, a dipole that is unusually large. It's so much larger than the, the, the mean largest dipole that you have in your event. The probability, actually, it solves uh, the probability distribution for this. Uh, the size of this dipole actually solves the decay equation. This is something that you, you can. You can, you can derive very, very precisely. Once you have this fluctuation, we assume that the further evolution is uh, deterministic. And th this is uh, your model for the, the evolution of the onion. Now we go back to our formula. So we need to compute the, these weights. When we, once we have these weights, actually, we, just by summation, we get the total and the diffractive cross section. OK, so these are the results. Just from the phenological model, we get complete expressions for uh, the, um, uh, here I, uh, I have to separate, I have essentially two uh, cases, the, uh, the weight of uh, one uh, uh, dipole uh, um, participating dipole and the weight of uh, k participating dipole k along or, or equal to, to two. So th this on the formula, so they are complete up to an overall constant, but it, it is the same in W1 and in all the W case. OK, what's already interesting is that um, you see that if you take the ratio, so the, the k dependence of the wk is for large k is, uh, goes like 1 over k squared. It means that uh, many exchanges, uh, many exchange events are, are typical. It's, uh, it's really easy to have, uh, as soon as you have uh, two exchanges, uh, two dipoles that, uh, that scatter, it's very easy to have, uh, to have um, many more exchanges. So this, this was already noticed by Gavin Salam in his PhD thesis. Now we have something quantitative to to characterize this, uh, the probability of this, uh, this number of exchanges. And this is uh, our main result. So this is <coughs> the gap distribution. Um, you have a set of factors here. So these factors were already known, and we derived it in, uh, two, uh, 2000, uh, in 2018. So the main factor here is this, uh, this, uh, this Y0 distribution here. That's really the, 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 the gap distribution. It's corrected, but by a factor that um, that is non uh, that is uh, different from one only if you if you go a, a little bit outside of the scaling region, and then uh, what's new 
is actually this constant. Uh, completely, uh, we are able to determine completely this constant. See, there's, there's a funny log two here. What's this log two? Well, it's just the sum of one over k, k minus one over all even values of, of k. So this log two is not innocent. You see that it has a, it has a really a, a nice interpretation as, as a summation of these uh, multiple exchanges. Okay, so this is my summary. Once again, our main formula with the, actually the, really the, the, the new result is, uh, is uh, that we are completely able to, uh, we are able to determine completely as the symptotics, including the overall constant. This is based on um, a few guesses, but how do you know that, how do we know that this is exact? Well, uh, we did uh, numerical checks um, to we went to infinite rapidities in a, in a model and uh, we checked that, uh, that, it is the, that this is the, the correct formula. So there's a nice uh, interpretation here. And so all our model is based on, uh, on the fact that the evolution of the uh, ionium fluctuations is essentially deterministic, except for, for one single large fluctuation. And also we found that uh, typically many exchanges uh, occur, occur. So it's not just uh, one, uh, one dipole that uh, participates, but, uh, but many is, uh, is the typical case. Okay, so the outlook, uh, well, we want to see if this, uh, this okay, this is asymptotic and this is really infinite, uh, infinite rapidities. Uh, then you have uh, subdivision corrections. We want to see what, what may survive uh, at, uh, at realistic rapidities. So this uh, is uh, the independent work of, uh, of Doom. So I encourage you to, uh, to listen to his uh, flash talk and to talk to him uh, in the poster session. And uh, okay, um, we, 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 may, we may want to now to, to understand uh, systematically the, the finite, finite rapidity corrections, which turn out to be, to be good. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any questions or comments? Uh, yes, um, Golik and then Yuri. Uh, Stefan, hi. Uh, could you remind me, in fact, I mean, how is this result or these results you have obtained Related to the results you would obtain from the uh, uh, from the uh, Kovchegov Levin equation and of course the Kovchegov Balitsky yes. equation. I mean, are there any relation? Is there any relation between this uh, yes, result yes, yes, and yes, the so asymptotic so results from these equations? Yes. So uh, this is the uh, this is the asymptotic solution to the the Kovchegov Levin equation. So I, I, I should um, I should precise I, I should uh, be, be precise what I mean by asymptotic. So Kovchegov-Levin equation is already large NC large nucleus, yes, no, 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 no. And including this this uh, red uh, normalization. Yes, 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 uh, absolutely yes, yes. So all, all this uh, all this we believe that it's uh, the asymptotic solution. So asymptotic. Uh, so okay, asymptotic. It's uh, long to y here. Yes, it's the, the, the dominant term when you when you take uh, y to uh, the very large values of the, the, the total rapidity. This is supposed to be the exact analytic uh, uh, asymptotic. So we, again, we believe this. So it's based on a lot of guesses, uh, uh, but we believe this because we have uh, we have checked uh, numerically. We took uh, not exactly the valid speaker of equation, but uh, another equation that we believe is in, in the same uh, universality class. Uh, and that we could, uh, for which we could take very, very, very large of the values of the rapidities and we check accurately to sort of 1%, uh, uh, but this is the correct factor. Okay, uh, thank you. And Julie, you have a question. Yes, yeah, sort of just to understand the main result and I, maybe you said the prefactor is new, the rest is not so new. So I probably should know that if I look at this, uh, it seems like, the rapidity gaps, why not, which are favored, are either very small or very large, covering the entire rapidity interval, right? So your distribution of the gaps, uh, you know, has a singularity, sort of a smaller gaps, then goes down and then goes up again. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And could you comment? Because uh, when, when Jenny Levin and myself analyzed this 20 odd years ago, we, we had pretty much the inverse shape. The, the probability of a gap was increasing first, then it had a maximum and it was decreasing. And yours decreases first seems to have a minimum and then increases. Is that correct? Yes, 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 yes. And, and this is correct. Um, so I guess that um, you, um, you didn't go uh, asymptotic enough or not, not exactly in the same region. So this is really in the scaling region, you have to go. Uh, so in the scaling region, yeah. Okay, I, I was very fast on this. Uh, so you have to pick uh, all, 
in such a way that uh, the uh, log of, of QS satisfies these, uh, these uh, inequalities, you see. And uh, if you do this, if you go to very long trapezes, this is exactly what you get. So of course, the, um, the singularity at, at y0 equals 0 and y0 equals y, um, it, it's not there. Huh? Um, it's just that this formula is valid for very large y, uh, a very large uh, y0 also. But, but the shape is, uh, is what you described. So first, it, uh, so uh, the, the preferred values of the gaps are uh, <coughs> either the, the, full, the full rapidity interval or, um, or uh, a very small gaps. But Before, since you mentioned you have a, sorry, you have this condition in the other slide you just showed, is that for fixed coupling or running coupling? Uh, this well, is for fixed coupling, yes. Uh, uh, so you studied also for running coupling, I think. No, no, I, I'm just saying that at large, very naively, your condition at large rapidity would be violated because log of QS grows as Y and, and it has to be much smaller than something that grows square root of Y. Is that what you... Uh... Wait a minute. Yeah, lo log of QS should go yeah, linear yes, in yes, Y. Yes, uh, no, so no, no, it's, it's fine, but you have to, you see, you have to take on a very small, so uh, much smaller than, uh, than one of your QS. On the other hand, you have to keep it in this, uh, in this interval. No, no, this is fine, you can okay. take it. I would suggest, this yes. is a very interesting okay. discussion, but we, we should um, continue with the program. I, I will invite you to, to discuss online, in the, in, offline, sorry, <laughs> during the conference. Um, Okay, thank you so much, Stefan, and, and for the discussion uh, to all the participants. So now we go to the next talk um, by Jesse uh, Liu. I don't know if you could share now your screens. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So please, please go ahead. All right. Okay. So th thank you for, for coming to this talk. So I'm going to go back to the experimental world and discuss a couple of results from Atlas in the diffractive and soft QCD physics world. So just to remind people, there are uh, a variety of interconnected complementary probes of the non-perturbative regime of Q uh, QCD, as, as we're hearing in this workshop. Uh, the laboratory, which we're going to focus on today. There's, of course, cosmic ray uh, probes uh, of soft QCD in nature, and of course, the theoretical uh, computations from models and generators connecting these experimental results. And the reason why we want to do this, as we're uh, here at this workshop, is to understand the strong force, because it is still fundamentally mysterious. There are both foundational as well as practical open questions that continue to endure. Why is this the only force that confines? Does it accidentally or dynamically conserve CP? All the way to uh, understanding more practical issues like how do we model cosmic ray air showers better? How do we understand uh, long range dynamics uh, and how, how they emerge? As well as improving Monte Carlo precision to improve our probes of new physics. I'll just show a slide of a retrospective of the past decade of the diverse results that we've been uh, producing from the Atlas collaboration. So this is, of course, at the Energy Frontier at the Large Hadron Collider. The fundamental measurements uh, on the left are these total inelastic and elastic cross-sections that go way back uh, several decades, and now we're pushing uh, into the, the Terra scale. We also measure differential measurements of charged particles, as well as neutral particles in various regimes. We measure event shapes, the long-range dynamics that can emerge, the underlying event measurements, as well as exclusive production. So experimentally, these often require dedicated detectors, special kinds of data runs, and non-standard techniques. So it's a real experimentalist's treat. And these, of course, advance our understanding of non-perturbative QCD, uh, as well as the modeling accuracy that's important for cosmic ray science. So today, I'm just going to highlight some two recent publications. So this uh, the upper one is single diffraction using the alpha spectrometer. This is using low mu data sets. And to complement this, we're also going to present uh, a very recently published result of photon fusion using the Atlas Forward proton detector. And this is using high luminosity data. So this is uh, two results demonstrating uh, forward proton spectrometry. So just to show you the forward region of ATLAS, so the usual central detector collisions happen on the left. 
There is the lucid detector for luminosity measurements uh, at just over 17 meters. The dipole magnets sweep the charged particles and the neutral particles just go straight down. There are calorimeters, the LHCF and ZEC detectors that measure these neutral particles. And then down the beam pipe, at just over 200 meters away are our particle spectrometers. And these measure the momenta of our proton. So there's Atlas forward proton, which is unique because it can also be operated at high luminosity as well as the alpha detectors. So these two spectrometers will be our focus today. So first, just to walk you through the alpha analysis, this is just over a year old now, but it's uh, still relatively uh, interesting and recent. So what we're trying to understand are these exchanges of these color singlets composed of gluons that we refer to as pomerons. And we try to measure the uh, diffractive system, this X, uh, as well as the proton on the other side. So the dominant background for this is uh, arising from, for example, pileup protons that are arising from uncorrelated uh, interactions from the central diffractive system. So for example, this is a, a double diffractive process where the uh, second uh, diffraction just disappears down the beam pipe. So the lower part of this shows you uh, an event display, not of a PP collision, but actually of a lead-lead event display. But it illustrates, I think, very well what a rapidity gap actually looks like in our detector. Right? You can see it's completely empty on one half and it's filled on the other side. So this analysis uses the minimum bias trigger scintillators um, to trigger on these events. And there is a large delta eta gap uh, that we require uh, re with respect to the opposite proton. So on the upper part of this slide, you can see the signal selection and these distributions in this Manushtan T variable, which is the momentum exchange, as well as this delta eta, this rapidity gap. And you can see how it dominates uh, the single diffractive process at very high values. So the lower part is just illustrating how the control regions to estimate the various backgrounds. So it's dominantly this overlay background that I was just talking about. And there's also a small contribution from this central diffraction process because uh, these protons uh, remain intact. And for example, one of them is not reconstructed. So this process we estimate using Monte Carlo. We do a bit of reweighting to improve the modeling. And the dominant background is estimated uh, by data. So just to flash the results, so that the takeaway from this is that the, uh, the data are actually overpredicted by several factors uh, with, uh, compared with the different Monte Carlo generators of Pythia and Herwig. So these are the, the fiducial cross sections where we can compare this. And there's also extrapolated uh, to, uh, into the regions where we can't, can't measure as well. And you can see how this is compared differentially with respect to this rapidity gap variable. And so you can see it's not quite constant. There is also some mild uh, differential mismodeling as well. Now, the other thing we can do with alpha are fairly precise uh, T measurements, these momentum transfer variable. So the, the usual way we do this is to fit this differential distribution to an exponential and to extract the slope parameter, which is this B. Right? And this actually agrees pretty well with uh, the Monte Carlo predictions. There are these two different tunes of Pythia that we compare to. And you can see how they're fairly consistent with the uh, measurement. And the systematics for this are dominated by this uh, proton overlay background. But it's still uh, statistically limited. So moving on to the more recent analysis, which is just a couple of months old. This is the Atlas forward proton analysis. So here, what we're doing is we're colliding photons uh, to produce two leptons. And this instrument we installed back in 2017 uh, and operated during the standard high lumi runs. And this is the first high luminosity physics publication using AFP. So the protons, they travel down the beam pipe. They're swept by the uh, magnetic field of the dipoles. And you can insert these silicon trackers, just as we heard a little bit earlier with the PPS on CMS, down to a couple of millimeters from the main beam to detect these scattered protons. So there are two stations just uh, at 205 and 217 meters. And the main observable of this detector is Xi, which is the fractional proton energy loss. So we measure gamma gamma to two leptons because it's a standard candle, but it's actually also interesting 
for its own sake. There is a wide range of science that is actually trying to probe this kind of process from laser physics uh, all the way to cosmic gamma ray collisions. You can see how these high energy gamma rays can strike a CMB photon, for example, and convert into two electrons. Very strong magnetic fields also occur naturally in around neutron stars, a special class called magnetars. And you can see even in these supernovae uh, pair instability core collapse processes, you can see how pair production actually plays uh, an interesting role here. And so the way you can view the LHC is uh, as a laboratory to study photon fusion production at the highest uh, laboratory energies. So we make these two measurements 210 meters apart. So we make a measurement using the AFP spectrometer. So this is a direct measurement of the proton fractional energy loss. So usually the dipole magnets bend our, our protons a certain amount, but if they have lost a bit of energy, the Lorentz force is slightly lower. And so they're deflected and you can relate the deflection X to the energy lost as we heard with the CMS uh, counterpart. On the other hand, you can also make these measurements in the central detector. So this is a bit like the Bjorken X formula. You measure the dilepton invariant mass and the rapidity, and the sign tells you in which direction it should go. And you can infer the fractional energy loss the proton must have been just by momentum conservation. So you can see in this upper plot, the orange and the, the red colors are the photon fusion signals and the blue is the background. So the signal, this is what happens when the protons and the leptons are correlated. They come from the same vertex. And we can define a nice signal region less than 0 0.005 to select these events. And this rejects 85% of this background and retains 95% of the signal. So this blue background, it, we estimate this by picking protons from data and then mixing them in into a random event sample. And we normalize this background using this sideband here. So this background arises dominantly due to pileup events, these diffractive events that strike AFP, and uh, they occur from a different interaction vertex that produces the leptons, for example, via drell yan So we've selected these uh, 180 events on that little peak. This is what they look like kinematically. So this is the dilepton rapidity on the vertical axis as a function of the dilepton invariant mass. So, some, so the colored regions are the uh, kinematic acceptance that corresponds to the AFP detectors. So at very low invariant masses, uh, you can see the system has to be boosted very longitudinally in, in the longitudinal direction. So this corresponds to when the two photons that collided were very asymmetric in momenta. Now at very high invariant masses, this corresponds to when the, the photons collide very, very symmetric and high momenta, and you can produce the two leptons very centrally. And you'll also notice that the orange dots, uh, it populates a little bit lower in the invariant mass. That's due to the trigger requirements being slightly lower for the, for the muons. And just to orient you the direction, side A, uh, A is for airport, which is uh, in, in Geneva. And this corresponds to where LHCB is. So just a snapshot of the results. So this is a, a pretty simple analysis because it's our, our first analysis is just uh, fiducial cut and count. So we define two Xi regions uh, to make our observation. So this is where we reject the background hypothesis. We select just over twice as many dimuon events and the significance in both channels are well above five sigma. Now we construct a slightly tighter region to perform our cross-section measurement using uh, this amount of data counts. And the reason why we do this is because recall I, I mentioned there were two stations on each side and this is the overlapping region in which these two stations have acceptance. So you can use this to do a data-driven estimate of the detector efficiencies by, uh, by tagging a proton in one of the stations and probing what is the probability of seeing a proton on the other station. And so this is the, this probability as a function of the Atlas runs in which AFP was inserted. And you'll see how the green and the, or and the pink are the far stations which is slightly lower by a couple of percent. And that's due to the showers that are induced by the protons striking the nearest station. And you can see it, that it's fairly stable, a couple of percent that we assign as systematics. And this is the first time that we've derived this unfolding uh, detector correction factor to measure these cross sections. So these are the two numbers here. Currently, it's still statistically limited. And you can see we're comparing it to state-of-the-art supersheet calculations 
uh, right here. So you'll notice that there's a slight overprediction of the of the data, and this is actually also something we've been seeing uh, in other atlas results. So the reason why this measurement is important ultimately is because we're trying to probe these soft QCD processes, right? The protons can actually also dissociate. There's also rescattering. The protons can exchange extra gluons. And these things are very difficult to, to probe, but it's crucial if we want to make precision calculations. And so you can see one of the issues here. This is the measured cross-section of the dimuon production with respect to just a pure exclusive EPA. So this is the uh, equivalent photon approximation, which is just this exclusive component. So you can see there's a systematic uh, uh, slightly lower measurements uh, compared with the dashed green, which is the super sheet predictions. And you can see uh, compared with uh, uh, this so-called finite size correction. So there's some tension even between uh, theory predictions. And so one of the possible ways in the future, just as an outlook comment, is that there is this golden diamond region here, right? which is where we can tag both the protons if we had enough statistics. And the reason why you'd like to do this is because you want to have a model independent way of separating these double proton processes compared to just single proton processes to better disentangle these different soft QCD processes in the same phase space. And so to summarize, I, I hope I've shown you in these two examples uh, one slightly older using the alpha experiment and one uh, brand new using the AFP experiment, how we're using proton tagging ultimately to expand our repertoire to probe the microcosm. And this is a, a picture that we often show our newcomers of all the particles we can reconstruct. And ultimately, the, these protons were always you know, flying down the beam pipe all the time. And unless you install these detectors, uh, we cannot uh, see these protons. And so this is really a new instrument to probe nature in ways we've never done before. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, um, very interesting results. So are there any comments or questions? Please raise your hand. Yeah, uh, Anthony, you have, please. I have a question concerning statistics. Is the statistics of uh, lepton production a final statistics or or still not the whole data was analyzed from run two? So we only had 14.6 inverse femtobarn of good quality data that we collected during run two, but we expect to have an order of magnitude more statistics in run three. In run three? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other question or comments? So if not, I will suggest that we move on with the next talk for, um, for the program. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. And now yeah. uh, we have the last talk of this, of this uh, part of the of today we have, um, by Lesket uh, Adamskin um, from STAR. Please. Yeah, I cannot hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, now no, it's fine. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, so, okay, so I will talk about the measurement of charged particle production in single diffractive proton-proton collision with the star detector. So the topic was already uh, introduced by the previous speaker. Uh, so I will focus on the motivation we had uh, to do this measurement in star. So first of all, the total uh, single diffractive cross-section is large and not uh, very well experimentally and theoretically separated from other pro processes. Uh, so the next, um, most of the previous analyses are based on the rapidity gaps. And this method is not able to fully distinguish between the single diffractive and other, other processes. There is no direct access to underlying dynamics uh, by a measurement of the uh, for example, squared for momentum transfer in the proton ver vertex or uh, fractional energy loss of the intact proton. So in the star, we have uh, uh, Roman pot detectors, which can uh, measure the forward proton. And this is the main motivation uh, to do this measure measurement with this uh, forward proton tagging. We can suppress other processes and the, we direct have a direct access to TNXI. 
And uh, also from the very few uh, measurements with the forward proton tagging, only UA4 in fact provides some information about uh, properties of the um, uh, diffractive system X in terms of, of particle densities. Uh, so, so we want to measure this. So uh, the measurement is, is uh, done to better understand the significant part of the total proton-proton cross-section to improve understanding of the proton structure and to measure uh, properties, fragmentation and hadronization properties of the uh, diffractively um, excited proton and to better interpretation, interpretation of cosmic ray air showers. So the experimental setup is shown on this uh, diagrams. So the intact protons, um, the final state are scattered uh, through a very small angle and measured in Roman pot. Detectors uh, located uh, something like 16 meter from the interaction point. Um, and the other proton that associates to produce a multipart partonic uh, system X. Uh, so the charged particle tracks with PT greater than 0.2 and rapidity between plus minus one are measured in the time projection uh, chamber. And also uh, uh, we can do particle identification through the specific energy loss of these uh, particles in the in the TPC. However, TPC is not fast detector, so for the trigger we use the coincidence of the signals from the Roman pods and uh, time of fly uh, detectors uh, uh, located also in the central region um, around TPC. And also we use uh, VITO uh, detectors, beam beam counter, uh, which covers the rapidity from 3.3 to 5.2 and zero degree calorimeter on the proton side to, to suppress events with, uh, with, without rapidity gap. Uh, so the, the principles of the measurement, we use this TPC to, uh, to measure uh, the properties of the diffractive state. So we measured uh, particle uh, multiplicities and density is a function of PT and, and rapidity. On the red, you can see the fiducial region of our measurement. It is uh, limited to quite small uh, multiplicity from two to, to eight because the energy is, 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 not, uh, is not large. We also use uh, this um, uh, specific energy loss to measure, uh, uh, to identify particle and we provide the measurement of the um, particle to antiparticle ratio for pion counts and protons, and also ratio of the counts to, to pions. We plan to add uh, for the final results also the ratio of proton to pions. And uh, the measurement is limited uh, to, to, to this T range and, and, and Xi. T range uh, is, uh, it comes from the acceptance of the Roman pot detector and the Xi mainly from the from the central uh, detector uh, acceptance and, uh, and uh, um, some re region where, where the uh, process is, is, is important. So a few words about the Monte Carlo generators. <clears throat> so uh, we do quite extensive comparison of the data uh, with, uh, with models implemented uh, in form of the general purpose uh, generators, uh, we mainly use PTI-8, uh, where um, the diffractive cross-section is parameterized based on the uh, triple rege F4 formula with uh, linear uh, Pomeron trajectory. And as a consequence, the cross-section is uh, uh, proportional to, to one over square, uh, one over Xi, uh, to the power related to Pomeron trajectory intercept. And the T distribution is exponential with the, the slope, which, which uh, weakly depends on Xi through uh, the Pomeron in trajectory slope. And what is also important in, in this all uh, PETIA models, uh, the, these cross sections is to some extent arbitrarily suppressed at large value of Xi above 10%. 
so so we usually do not have this this pure triple regge parameterization. Uh, uh, Petya use a long string model hadronization, and we use this uh, say default version uh, of of Petya for detector uh, effects correction for for unfolding and for for background subtraction. Uh, so these these main samples uh, are uh, embedded into the star collision data and and uh, fully. Uh, simulated. We also have additional samples uh, for the comparison with uh, uh, with the results. Um, for Petya, uh, we use this minimum bias Rockefeller model, um, uh, and also the same model, but uh, without this um, arbitrary suppression of, of of large values of, of xi. Um, we also compare the results with Herwig. Which has some alternative <coughs> cluster hadronization model compared to Pythia and to EPOS, which has also an alternative string uh, string model. So I would like to say also a few words about the EPOS because, uh, as you will see, EPOS predicts a very large contribution of forward protons, which are uh, well separated in in rapidity from other final states, but comes from the non-diffractive events. So this is a, a unique feature of, of EPOS. We don't see such events uh, in, in Pythia. Uh, um, so we decided to, for, for the comparison to, to separate the, the special kind of, of events. So I will show the re regular EPOS uh, single diffractive as the SD, SD prime is this non-diffractive um, uh, contribution which have, has a non-diffractive flag in the generator, however, uh, such events has a forward proton and and well and, and large rapidity gap, and the other uh, events non diffractive are uh, shown as the EPOS uh, ND. So the background uh, uh, on this plot I show um, in, uh, the xi distribution uh, measured uh, in 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 star as uh, as a dots. And uh, so we have two main sources of the background, accidental background, which comes from the uh, some accidental coincidence of, of activities from, from many uh, sources. This is shown by the yellow um, distribution, which this background dominates at very small x, below 2%. And the second contribution is the single sources backgrounds originating from, from double diffractive, central diffractive, or, or non-diffractive. And these are shown by the color histograms. The pure uh, single diffractive is, is, is shown as a, a white histogram. So the left column shows the district uh, comparison with uh, Pythia. Uh, two tunes, this um, uh, default uh, C4 and um, on the bottom, uh, and and the upper plot shows the um, uh, minimum bias Rockefeller model. Uh, so as you can see, the data uh, do not uh, uh, the Monte Carlo does not describe this this shape, this two two steep distributions, and it is not possible with reasonable values of uh, Pomeron uh, intercept to, to to describe this behavior. Right upper plot shows uh, also the MBR model, but with uh, without this uh, arbitrary suppression of pure triple regge uh, parameterization. So as you can see, this this uh, this, mm, this helps uh, to describe the data. And the the bottom right uh, distribution as are for the EPOS, and uh, here with this gray histogram, uh, we plot this. Um, uh, um, EPOS as the prime, which is fact, in fact is the, is the non-diffractive origin with the non-diffractive uh, flag from the generator, uh, and and as you can see, this this um, contribution dominates uh, um, the prediction from from EPOS. Uh, three more minutes. Okay. Uh, so um, now the results. So uh, charge. Uh, particle multiplicities. We we show these results in three um, beams of xi. Uh, all the results left from two point uh, from two to to five percent. The middle from five to ten percent, 
and the right from 10 to 20 percent. On the bottom, you can see this uh, average charge particle multiplicity is a function of xi. So generally, the data exhibits uh, the predicted uh, distribution. Um, the average multiplicity increases uh, with with xi, and the shapes are uh, quite well described by by Pitya. Uh, we can also um, uh, compare um, this uh, particle densities with uh, non-single diffractive. Uh, processes, uh, plotting this particle density in the middle rapidity uh, for diffractive processes at, uh, at uh, the scale of, of the mass of the diffractive system and for the non-diffractive um, uh, measurements uh, for the, uh, as a function of uh, collision energy. So the plot shows um, the previous measurements uh, for non-single diffractive enhanced uh, processes so the feed comes from this um, uh, publication on the bottom. There are also the references to the uh, to these measurements. And as you can see, this uh, our preliminary results uh, lies uh, very well on this on this curve. So this suggests that uh, we see some similar similarity of charge particle uh, densities at, at mid rapidity between uh, single diffractive and non diffractive processes. Uh, this plot shows the uh, densities as a function of PT with in these three XI regions. And the bottom plot shows the XI dependence. So data do not show any, any dependence uh, on XI and, uh, and, and PT. Uh, so generally, uh, all the models predict this uh, quite well, except the hair week. Now, particle ratios. Uh, pi minus to pi plus and k plus k minus to k k plus. Uh, so we expect that, that this this ratio should tend to unity if the fragmentation is the dominant source of the particle production, and this is what we can con con confirm from the from the data. And the models also uh, um, predicts this uh, uh, unit ratio except Herwig where at the smallest xi we see some uh, 10 to 20 percent discrepancies. This might be also connected with, uh, with the results for the um, anti-proton to proton ratio. So this observable is sensitive to the baryon number transfer from the forward to mid rapidity in the proton-proton scattering. Uh, so for the non-diffractive processes, this ratio was measured to be 0.8. So we expect that in the single diffractive, it should be slightly higher. Uh, so the PETIA predicts 0.95. Uh, so, so the measurement shows, uh, at least in this first uh, XI region, that the data is uh, somehow below uh, the predictions from PETIA and from, uh, from um, EPOS as the prime. And uh, we see a, a very uh, big disagreement um, uh, in the first XI region uh, from the Herwig. Um, uh, Herwig shows uh, a significant XI dependence. And uh, this is connected with the fact that uh, in, in Herwig, the net baryon appears always uh, very close to the rapidity H, uh, close to the um, maximum rapidity. This is the so-called backward uh, baryon transfer in the in the in the diffraction, and the, the RAS result, RAS, uh, results is the ratio of uh, kaon to to pions in three xi regions, so uh, up to as a function of transverse momentum up to 0.5. Uh, the data and predictions from from Petya and uh, EPOS uh, are in, in agreement above 0.5. We see uh, the change of the slope in the data, which is not uh, predicted by these models. So, so this uh, somehow suggests that um, uh, the, 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 the suppression of the SS bar uh, production in the fragment, fragmentation proce process is too strong in, in these models. For example, in Pitya, it is 0.2 compared to, to the light quarks. And some dependence of the, uh, the PT suggests that uh, uh, the, the transverse momentum kicks during the, the, the string break is larger for uh, SS bar 
compared to the uh, UU bar or DD bar. And uh, summary, so we performed the measurement of the, the inclusive single diffractive uh, process. Uh, we measured, uh, we, we are using the forward proton tagging technique, and uh, we measured inclusive and identified charge particle production uh, in single diffractive. Uh, we see the significant, significant differences uh, between um, the psi distribution uh, in the data and, 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 and in, in models. Uh, among models, um, the EPOS, LHC, and, and PITIA without suppression of diffractive cross section at large psi uh, provides the best description. Uh, we see some similarity, similarity between the diffractive system uh, of mass MX and non diffractive uh, PP collision at, at the, at the uh, uh, at the same um, collision energy. Uh, so the production ratio are, are close, particle to antiparticle are close to, to unity, uh, except for the hair week. And uh, it seems that we see some non-negligible baryon number transfer uh, in, in the data. And the ratio of count to pion suggests that uh, um, uh, SS bar uh, is uh, too strong suppressed in the in, in the fragmentation models uh, used using Petya and in in EPOS. Uh, so thank you. That's all from me. Thank you. Um, now there is a question, uh, Rainer. Please. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, I would like to uh, ask you the following question. What is the role of uh, region exchanges in your measurement and interpretation of measurement? Like an exchange of a row zero, you make an N star uh, resonance on the other side that decays back to the proton by a pi zero emission, which then gives two gammas. Would you be able or are you able to identify that reaction channel? Uh, I don't think so, no. So, so where does that go in your um, discussion here? Is this part of the background, or is it part of the? Where does it go? This 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 particular channel, the region exchanges. So the region exchanges. You, you have data at one energy. If you have, if you had data at two or three different energies, because region and Pomeran exchanges have different energy dependencies. So are you yes. planning to take data at a different energy than what you said here you have at 200 GeV? So we have data at 500 GeV, but uh, at the moment uh, uh, there is no manpower to do the analysis. But, but in principle, we can, we can uh, try to study this. And of course, there are energy at higher, data at higher energies, um, for example, uh, in, in at LHC, so so we can say something comparing these two different measurements. Yes. So I'm wondering, you know, the Krakow theory group has lots of uh, experiences in uh, theoretical calculations. So then I think that should be rather straightforward to estimate that region contribution, wouldn't it? Well, uh, Rene, I will suggest this is a very good question and discussion, but I'll suggest that um, you discuss this offline um, now, and uh, and then we close the we close the session. And um, yeah, if you would like to continue discussing, that's okay. But we, we should close now and and for this session and wait for the next one that it will be in uh, fifteen minutes from now, right? Marta will share it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the talk and thank you everybody for, for joining and participating.